continuing on with different types and classifications, ways to classify pain. Pain's also classified based on whether it's mild, moderate, or severe. So if we're looking at a number rating scale, you know, usually when we look at, if we're looking at mild pain, we're looking up to about a rating of four if we're looking at a zero to 10 scale. Moderate would be about five or six, and then severe would be probably something like seven or greater. Then you could also classify based on origin uh, where you have different different classifications within that. So you have your, your nociceptive, which would be just the specific response to the injury uh, based on the body structures that were damaged. You have the neuropathic type of pain, which is specific to damage to nerve fibers or if there's some type of dysfunction. Usually you'll see this a lot of times in chronic type pain, particularly the chronic type pain that isn't really explained very well. You have your idiopathic pain, which means it's pain of unknown origin. And then you have your learned pain, which is developed from pain memories. And this is again, that psychological, emotional component to pain that we've discussed. Different things could also be, can modify the pain experience. And these are things you may either witness with a patient or possibly have them tell you in an assessment when you start talking about things that make your pain worse, make their pain better. For instance, movement could often make the pain worse, certain types of movements, uh, particularly when nerves get impinged or get put in uncomfortable positions. Again, they're gonna be a little hypersensitive. So the thing you have to be careful of is, particularly when you look at individuals who are trying to compensate for different things and, and trying to more or less make themselves comfortable by putting themselves in bad positions, you need to make sure that you encourage good mechanics right away. For instance, if someone is limping, they have a tendency to, to bend their spine in certain positions, you wanna make sure that you encourage good mechanics as quickly as you can. Stress can make pain worse as well. The damaged nerves can become sensitive to stress-produced chemicals. So it's, it's important to make sure that, again, if, if the stress is gonna produce certain chemicals, it's gonna make the pain worse, you're gonna be kind of putting yourself in, in one of those bad cycles again of, of pain bringing about more pain. Zings, as your book describes them, are basically little shots of pain that kind of come out without warning. Again, usually this is, is nerve related, um, particularly if you get pain stemming from a dorsal root ganglion. You know, again, putting yourself in certain positions or all of a sudden you'll randomly notice the sporadic shots of pain that occurs. Pain of delayed onset, all that basically means is it's, it's just more or less that. You don't get any symptoms uh, for days or weeks. You may get pain and then the pain again, we'll, we'll go away for a while. So it's, it's usually, it just basically describes the onset of pain. Spontaneous skin itch deals with itching over skin zones in a painful area. For instance, some patients will describe a prickly or strange feeling on the skin uh, as it relates to their pain experience. And then the last thing, um, cognitive behavioral strategies, they're basically, a set of behaviors used to modulate their perception or their interpretation of pain. So these things could include meditation, relaxation, fear, uh, depression, former pain experience, family and cultural influences are all things that can be used to um, kind of modify the, uh, the pain experience. Pain neuromatrix and the approach for chronic pain. So again, chronic pain could become a, a pretty difficult thing to kind of deal with. Looking at how this all interacts, when the, the whole neuromatrix component of pain basically functions off this. When, when the brain thinks the body's in danger, you'll experience pain. And again, the purpose of that pain initially is to produce some type of action. Now, the problem becomes is when 
that input strengthens, pain can be produced with less input, even through non-nociceptive mechanisms. So basically, that the, it gets easier and easier for the person to experience pain. So what you want to do is you kind of want to break that up a little bit. You want to try to reduce inputs. You want to try to make sure that we somewhat close off the ability of the, the body to experience this pain. So some ways to kind of deal with this, um, cryokinetics and cryostretch. Both of these types of therapies are essentially used to limit the, the input or the sensory transmission of pain with the cold and then allow for progressively increasing levels of, of activity. So by decreasing the pain input and allowing for more activity, that could bring about a decrease in the chronic pain. So basically what the person starts to do is, the person starts to do a lot more activity in the absence of pain, and therefore kind of deals with this whole neuromatrix aspect of pain being produced from all of these different inputs not necessarily associated with the original injury. Using central control is another thing that can be used to decrease pain. It's, it's dealing with the subjective experience of pain because essentially what ends up happening is, or your, your pain experience basically ends up happening at the brain. So again, while we do have the structural aspect of pain, we also have our, our past experiences and, and emotional influences and things like that that also influence our perception of pain. So our, our brain basically stores all this information you know, from past experiences and it creates this situation where we now have this effect what happens in injuries and things like that that happen down the road. You can also use central control to decrease pain as well, which we're going to be talking about later on in this discussion. So while it could affect or actually make the pain experience worse potentially, depending on what past experiences were, you can actually use it to decrease pain as well. Um, there's, uh, on, starting on page 157, there's some text examples of different things that influence our pain experiencers or examples showing how this works. And I'll give one here. They, they talk about that the sight of blood intensifies the pain experience. So when, when you deal with children, you may have a situation where, you know, an injury is pretty mild, it's no big deal. And then all of a sudden they see blood from the injury. And then again, from that input coming in from the, the actual visual input, is going to basically create a more noxious stimulus. So at one time the injury wasn't that bad, all of a sudden there's a little bleeding and then it, it changes how they react. So normally it'll seem mild at first, no big deal. All of a sudden look and see the blood, now they start crying and they're upset. So that that influences that. And there's, there's a couple other examples so you can take a look at how that can be used in, in kind of modifying or influencing someone's pain experience. This takes us to our, our three modes of analgesia or our three modes of pain control. So basically all of the theories and everything that we looked at kind of outline or set up the, the different types of pain control. And these are the ones that we talked about in lab. We have our modified gait control, so a slightly mod modified version of the gait control level, level one at the spinal cord or your ascending inhibition. You have your level two, your descending inhibition coming down from the brain. And then level three, your erogenous opiate control level coming from the, the higher brain regions. So your level one ascending is going to be your pain relief via the gating mechanism at the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. So where you have your non-pain, your A beta fibers, your large sensory fibers stimulate it. The substantia gelatinosa closes the gate, the gate being the T cell. 
and blocks the pain. The, the updated version of this is that within the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, there's also what's known as an enkephalin interneuron, which further blocks the pain signal. And some examples of things that, that bring about this response, your sensory tens, so your, your low intensity, high frequency uh, sensory tens, your massage, and, and the massage being your more superficial sensory type massage, as opposed to the deep tissue, which caught, which usually does and is comfort that would come in some some different forms, and also your cryotherapy and your moist heat would be examples of level one gait control pain relief. Level two is going to be your descending inhibitory control. So here now we're looking to stimulate your pain fibers. Most particularly with this type, we're looking at painful stimulation of your type C fibers. So your very small type C fibers are going to be stimulated with the type of modality that we're going to use. And the way this works is you stimulate those pain fibers, the raft nucleus and the periaqueductal gray region in the, in the brain send descending messages down via serotonin and enkephalin to block pain down at the spinal cord. So the modulation of pain still occurs at the spinal cord, but instead of it coming up from the sensory level, it's coming down from the brain. And basically the, the way that we do this with modalities is we can use either a noxious TENS, so a high intensity and high frequency TENS so basically you take that, uh, that, that sensory tens that you know typically we feel the nice kind of pins and needles tingling sensation and just more or less turn up the intensity on that to the point where it's almost delivering like a noxious or slightly uncomfortable type of tens. Or you can also deliver this um, through something such as acupressure. So both of those would, would stimulate those pain fibers. And then the, the last one, the endogenous opiates theory. So if you, again, you notice the difference, and we talked about this in lab. If you notice the difference with this one is nothing is acting directly at the spinal cord. So what basically is happening here is the release of beta endorphins from the pituitary gland is going to cause long-term uh, pain relief. Uh, throughout the body. So it's not something that particularly just comes right down to the spinal cord. You basically now will get a much uh, longer uh, pain relief. So for instance, with the gate control theory, you're only really getting pain relief for the time that the modality is being used on the patient. And then maybe for a real short time after, level three pain control has a relatively long, uh, long relief period. So you get the, this long-term relief. You get this typically with motor TENS. So using your TENS at a low frequency to evoke a motor response, this is gonna be stimulate, this is gonna stimulate your A delta fibers. So descending stimulates type C, your endogenous opiate or is gonna stimulate your A delta fibers. And again, there's, there's gonna be a long-term stimulation um, from the, the relief that comes about with this.